Coming up on this week's show, how to manage your own virtual arcade. Was Robin Williams the first podcaster? And we go inside the early days of Atari with special guest Ed Rotberg. And the Retro Hour podcast is brought to you every week with our wonderful friends at Bitmap Books. Now, one of their books that is fantastic reading for the summer, A Gremlin in the Works. If you're a fan of games like Monty Mole, Thing on a Spring, Zool, Lotus Turbo Challenge, you're going to love this nostalgic trip back through Gremlin Graphics Archives. You can check that out and the rest of their retro gaming books at bitmapbooks.com. And with our lovely friends at PCBY. Now, if you're working on an electronics project at the moment, they offer a fully featured custom PCB prototype service with low cost, fast turnaround quality boards. And they offer services like 3D printing and injection molding. And they're big supporters of the retro community. So get an instant quote for your project right now at PCBWay.com. Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 337, your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. Me, Ravi Abbott. And me, Joe Fox. And a very warm welcome to this week's show. Of course, the podcast every single Friday takes you on a journey inside the world of classic video games. And this show, I mean, we get new people coming in all the time. But it's kind of a show of two halves, really, isn't it? First half of the show, we bring you up to speed on all the big happenings in the world of retro gaming from over the last week. And then the second half of the show is when we welcome on a veteran of the industry to share some stories from behind the scenes of some of the biggest video games companies of all time. And today, I don't think they get much bigger than Atari. So we'll talk more about our special guest in just a minute. But of course, well into summer here in the UK now as well. And I've got to say, I think, you know, obviously everything was kind of on hold for the last couple of years, but things are starting to roll again this summer. We're starting to get out and about. We've got events lined up and some pretty exciting stuff coming up over the next few months. Yeah, things are being planned and in the works. You see, um, we do this podcast every week, arrange the interviews and do all of that. And it's quite a lot of work, but also we do a lot behind the scenes. So um, we have been kind of planning a lot of stuff where we mentioned that we're going out to Norway. Um, there may be some local kind of Midlands stuff going on in a uh, winter. And, uh, you know, we've also got a, a mega project in the works as well, which is taking up quite a lot of our time as well, but we're not taking focus off the main podcast. Yeah, we have got a big announcement to make um, in the next couple of weeks. I think our patrons already know what it is. We've kind of mentioned it on there, but there is something very exciting and actually something that I've got to say, um, probably second only to doing the podcast in terms of, you know, big things that we've done um, that we're going to be announcing in the next few weeks. So something that we, we've we been working on for a, about a year behind the scenes that we hope you're going to love. So we'll tell you more about that. Make sure you stay listening to the Retro Hour over the next few weeks. But of course, a very exciting show this week as well. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I love the fact that we just kind of explore so many different genres, so many different companies, so many different eras of gaming on the show. But there's always something very special about kind of going back to day one, I think, isn't there? Yeah, totally. Like, that's what this show's always been about, the kind of history and getting the story from the horse's mouth as it is. And, you know, actually getting people that were there in those early days of gaming. And I love doing some of the uh, more modern developers and stuff. But, man, talking about Atari and, you know, games designed before video games were actually a thing, (laughs) it's pretty amazing. Well, today we're going to be joined by Ed Rotberg in the second half of the show. And he was actually a core member of Atari's coin-op team back in there, you know, the golden age of Atari. And um, first game we worked on was called Atari Baseball that came out in 1979. And then I think the game that, you know, it was so innovative, wasn't it? One of the games he's most known for, the classic Battle Zone. That I've seen, you know, people refer to that as kind of the first ever first-person shooter game, really. Yeah, it was, it was a wicked game. It was a kind of wireframe tank game. And I, I totally remember, like, it had so many remakes, but one big memory for me was... Uh, when I first used the internet and I went online and I was like, you can play games online. And there was a Java version of battle (laughs) zone. And I was like, Oh my God, I could actually go on a website and just play one of these classics straight away. And uh, it was such a, such a fantastic title that was, but you know, he also worked later into the developments of uh, polygons and uh, stuff like hard driving, uh, stun runner as well. And, 
they've moved on. Not just Atari, he was also working with Apple and uh, the Freedio company as well. So Ed's definitely been around in the industry. Yeah, so he's a fantastic guest. And also we hear the stories, um, which is quite bizarre, how Battlezone was actually commissioned by the American Army at one point as well, and he had to make a special version of it or kind of you know find out the story behind why that happened and what that was like. Our special guest, Ed Rotberg, he's going to be coming up on the show in around half an hour from now. Now, we have got a lot of new stories to get through this week. Let's start with this one. Um, quite an interesting revelation. You know, generally, when we talk about the first ever podcaster, there is one guy whose name always comes up, and that is Adam Curry. Yeah, and um, he's generally regarded as a guy who founded the podcasting industry, isn't he? Yeah, and it's kind of because he has gone around and said, like, I am the, the pod father. <laughs> and <Yeah>. um, <laughs> Adam Curry, if you don't remember him, he was uh, like the VJ, which is like a video DJ on MTV. So he's kind of like one of these big personalities back then. And I think it was around 2004 that he was kind of doing podcasts and he, he claimed the term podcast, I think. And... Um, Steve Jobs was, you know, obviously launching iTunes and stuff. So it took a big kind of leap onto Adam Curry. And there's that famous uh, footage where Steve Jobs is announcing podcasting to the world, plays a section of Adam Curry's podcast. And then uh, Adam Curry starts effing and swearing about uh, the Apple Mac and how uh, badly his one's running. So uh, that was a big (laughs) cause of embarrassment for him. You know someone got fired after that. Yeah, surely. totally. Like, <laughs> uh, who, who didn't check this? I can imagine Steve after the uh, after the conference. <laughs> but it's interesting because, um, obviously, kind of the idea of like internet radio, I remember that kind of being around in the 90s, you know, listening to internet radio in about 97, 98. I actually used to do an internet radio show. What, what you know, format when I was, was it? Was it that, uh, that real, real audio? audio? Yeah, real audio stream. Oh, that was awful something- quality, wasn't it? <laughs> Sounded like listening down the phone. Yeah, it was dreadful. Um, But obviously a podcast, it's kind of got to be a pre-recorded show, hasn't it, that's delivered, you know, like on demand. But it turns out um, a little article has appeared this week, and I've seen this shared in a few places, an interview with Robin Williams. Now, it turned out that he was working with Audible back in the day. Now, obviously Audible have been an audiobooks company for a long time. Now it's all kind of online-based. But it turned out he was actually doing an internet talk show for Audible that he started in January 2000. Now, I must admit, I wasn't familiar with this show before, but there's quite an interesting little clip here of Robin Williams on the Charlie Rose show in the year 2000 talking about this internet show that he's doing and the description of this. How much does this sound like a podcast? Have a listen. So that we so it's will basically be- downloadable... Sound means, hence the title, audible. Oh, yes. Edible, which would be food. (laughs) And uh, you can load it onto your computer and then load it onto what you have there, which is a Diamond Rio player, and then you can play it back. And what what is in the archive? Yeah, but what's on there is uh, some, you know, stuff with just myself, monologues and kind of freeform, and uh, and other things which are conversations with friends, like Oliver Sacks, Susan Sarandon, John Irving, uh, Mario Cuomo. It's all like sound files, so that's normally a music player, which can yeah. play several hours of music, but you can load much more just sound or, you know, spoken word, 20 hours of spoken word onto one of those. Now, today, obviously, every celebrity's got a podcast where they interview other comedians and their friends, but that sounds like what Robin Williams was doing, like, 22 years ago. It's really interesting because it's like, he's kind of trying, to, it, it definitely sounds like he's trying to describe a podcast before we knew what a podcast was. You know, Mm. like he's hitting the nail on the head. You know, he's like, oh, it's files you can download and it's conversations and monologues. Like it is 100 percent. I would say that is essentially what a podcast is. And what's that like four years prior or something like that, which is just absolutely crazy. Um, I mean, I didn't even know what an MP3 player was in the year 2000, which is also really interesting. That's quite cool that he actually mentions the Diamond Rio. Like, mm. you know, later on... My first MP3 player. Yeah, later on, they'd be like, oh, the iPod, that's what you put it on. But it's yeah. so early, it's like the diamond rear. I don't think many people will actually remember those as well. Like, if you showed a kid this nowadays and said, this is the first MP3 player or a very early one, they'd be like, my God. I showed my little nephew, like, floppy disks and cassette tapes and asked him what he thought they were. And he's like, oh, I don't know. Do you, do you scrape your car with that or something? And I had no <laughs> idea what they were. <laughs> I mean, you could do. <laughs> 
<laughs> I use CD cases for that, obviously. Um, but also, I mean, I'll link up this article with the Robbie Williams clip in there. There's also a page of him trying to explain what it was to a very befuddled Jay Leno as well. That kind of reminds me, have you ever seen that clip of uh, Bill Gates trying to explain the internet to David Letterman yeah. in like 1995? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, it, yeah you know what? It's, it's quite similar to that, actually, now how you say that and now I think about it. But yeah, just was, uh, Robin Williams of all the people. What a guy, eh? Mm. There was a lot of that kind of bad explanation of internet. Uh, there was that guy, I think it was a senator, and he was like, the internet's a series of tubes, and if the oh, tubes yeah, get blocked up, yeah, it was the maddest explanation, and that became a meme. Yeah, well, it's, it's really interesting to look back on that kind of, you know, it just seems so innocent now, doesn't it? I guess the difference was that it wasn't distributed by an RSS feed, but I think, you know, podcasting now, you get them on YouTube and all that, it's not necessarily a, a defining factor of a podcast, and it was paid for as well. But quite interestingly, if you want to hear kind of what could be the world's first podcast. There is um, a little clip of it in this article on Pod News that I'll link up as well, where you can hear a Robin Williams chat with uh, David Crosby from the year 2000. It's like a two-part interview as well. So, um, yeah, quite interesting to see where it all began. Who'd have thought, I mean, I love Robin Williams, but who'd have thought that he'd been, you know, responsible for kind of our future careers one day? Thank you, Robin. So I'll link that up in our show notes at theretrohour.com. Speaking of future careers that you dreamed about as a kid, oh, who didn't want to run the own arcade? I uh, definitely didn't. I'd probably be like Nessa from Gavin and Stacey. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really good reference. I love that. I uh, I still want to run my arcade, but um, luckily I can now in the virtual world if I wanted to. But um, have you guys kind of noticed this like recent uprising? I say recent, maybe it's been around for a long time, but ga- mundane jobs being turned into games. What was it? That power wash power simulator. Wash, power wash simulator. Watching. Someone played that on Twitch the other day. Yeah, my my wife was playing that the other day, and I'm not going to lie, I've had I've had a good bash on that as well. Um, but yeah, lots of these games like chore simulators and stuff like that. But this is Arcade Paradise, which is coming out um, on August 11th for PS4 and PS5, which I guess is in the kind of the same vein of that genre of like mundane tasks, but there's a little bit more 80s to it. So essentially, you uh, play as a 19 year old college dropout who's been tasked by their father to go start their own business. And essentially, you can start your own arcade, as well as starting a laundromat, <laughs> which uh, is pretty cool. But um, yeah, you, you you essentially complete like mundane tasks, like, you know, em- emptying the change machines and, em- you know, cleaning the washers and cleaning your arcade machines and stuff like that. But off the back of it, it looks very 80s and nostalgic, doesn't it? I guess this concept is a new one coming from kind of crafting games and stuff yeah. like that where you you have to do the the grind and this is called Ar- arcade paradise the grind and I, I play a lot of these games and it's it's weird it's kind of therapeutic you know just uh yeah grinding and doing repetitive tasks and continually doing that but putting that in another setting is quite good and it's it's a weird dynamic isn't it you know as humans we go and do work and then as kind of our relaxation as, as entertainment, as entertainment you're sit, digital work. sitting yeah. there and doing digital work and you know it, it, it comes back to me playing that power wash simulator with my wife it makes me sit there and go i could be a power washer <laughs> like, <laughs> and you know this will probably make me think like i could be you know run my own arcade but you know you you're completely right it's you know it's it's in the same vein as i guess a similar vein of like these theme park games like theme you know theme park and theme world and stuff like that you know where you're essentially creating the arcade and you know, building it yourself. But what I think is really interesting is to buy your arcade machines, you literally have to use your like tablet to go on eBay and like bid on them and buy the arcade machines within the game. And obviously you use the money you make from, you know, your customers coming to your arcade and your laundry mat and stuff like that to then buy your games and obviously generate a profit and stuff like that. So you're doing this in game then? It looks like an Apple Newton or something. Yeah, you you literally play an Apple Newton and it's like while you're in game, you go on eBay and bid on the the arcade machines and stuff to then bring into your arcade. Um, You know, you can buy a DeLorean as your car and stuff like that. Like there's just so much like eighties and nineties nostalgia in it. Um, I'm not too sure. You know, I'm looking here though. And the prices are like $7,000. I'm hoping these are not in-game purchases. No, they're not real. I don't think that it's all part of the game. It's all part of like upgrading your arcade and stuff like that. Can you play the arcade games as well? I'm not a hundred percent sure. Like from looking at the, the trailer and kind of like reading the descriptions of the games and stuff like that. There is screenshots of the arcades being played and there's like a little beat em up game 
but I I think it might just be in the vein of do you remember in like the first theme park games where you could ride the yeah. ride? I think it's just like that. You can go. I, to the I, arcade I see machine. that they're they're playing solitaire on the Windows computer. So yeah, you, you can, can go into your office and do that. Yeah, you can play solitaire, and I think you can go up to the arcades and like watch what's. But being you played. know the amount of games you get these days where there are playable arcade machines in there, like Life is Strange and yeah, Call of Duty and stuff. It wouldn't be too much of a stretch to have some kind of simplistic clones of old arcade yeah, games. Yeah, or that even were these uh, VR arcade recreations that we're seeing. Mm. Um, this adds an extra element of play on top of that, where it's not just an arcade and you're walking around going to individual machines, you've got to maintain it and you've got to, yeah. you know, yeah, well, you, 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 do you, like you, uh, management style stuff. Yeah, and, and like you say, does that maintain element? You literally have to unblock toilets and clean the toilets and stuff <laughs> as well. So, you know, and, you know, wash all the arcade machines and stuff. So I wouldn't be surprised if you can play them, but the actual gameplay of itself is meant to be based all around the main the maintenance of it all and the, the running and the business of it and stuff. But, um yeah, it does look. You know what? I, I'm, I'm just picturing people like playing this, like you know, with a uh, glue to their PlayStation next to them. They've got like a pile of dishes in the sink. Oh yeah, they've got like you know dust on the side, and like the missus screaming at them to tidy up. Have, like you, I'm washing my arcade. Have you never played The Sims, Dan? Like The Sims, you know, your whole I life did, is absolutely yeah. perfect on The Sims, and then you look around and your house is a wreck because you've been yeah. playing it for like <laughs> two days. And, 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 and to go off on a tangent a little bit here, that literally happened to me like when the first version of GTA 5 came out, what was that, like 2013? And I was trying to 100% complete it. And the last thing I had to do in the game was when you, I'd done absolutely everything in the game, bar cleaning up the toxic waste from the bottom of the ocean when you got driving around a submarine. So I'm driving around in a submarine looking for toxic waste, cleaning the bottom of the ocean. And I was sat there in my bedroom. I still live with my mum at the time. And I literally thought to myself, I could literally be tidying my house right now. Like, I could, like, I'm doing this in this game and I could literally go do something with my life. Uh, but now it's come full circle that I'm sat here wanting to play Arcade Paradise. <laughs> yeah, it's two realities, isn't it, Jim? Yeah. You don't want to um, get stuck in the virtual one. This kind of goes back to, like, Lawnmower Simulator yeah. back in the day. You know, the fact that people were playing that, but the idea of actually going out in the garden and mowing the lawn, I uh, can't be bothered with that. I wonder if there's, like, you know, in the future, a way to get us to do maybe chores and have fun could be some kind of reward system, well, you know, if, if it kind of goes into actual reality and you earn like points for mowing your lawn at home and stuff like but, that. But whether people, it would, there, there, there are well. um, games online where like people are hired in like other countries and stuff just to grind for people, like in World of Warcraft in the game. and stuff. Yeah, yeah, so yeah just to level they, up and stuff. They have like farmers and stuff and, and that <laughs> will a height actually of be your job, you know. <laughs> Getting, paying someone else to play a video game for you. Yeah. But I've got to say, this does look fun. Arcade Paradise coming out on PS4 and PS5 on August 11th. It looks like it could be a game that could be quite easy to do in virtual reality as well. I'm wondering whether there'll be like a VR version now for the new PSVR 2 headset, um, which wouldn't surprise me. It looks like it's kind of built for that, really, doesn't it? So um, if you've ever dreamed of running your own arcade... They just need um, um, the the two P pusher machines, and if a kid knocks it, you can run out and shout at them. <laughs> <That'd> be quite <laughs> good. <laughs> Come out running with a mop in your hand to fight them or something. Oh, the alarm sound of those in Butlins as a kid still <laughs> ingrained in my like memory. that episode of Mr. Bean when he's <laughs> trying to get away with knocking it. So bringing it back to the real world, if you want something to uh, spend your hard earned cash on this summer, we see a lot of these coming along recently. There is another lego retro console and this one i've got a feeling is going to be a bit of a cult classic there is now an official lego atari 2600 i love the little um subheading on this website on shortlist.com from bits to bricks i'm surprised they haven't done that bits to bricks already like oh lego have like mm. you know snatched that or something but yeah man this is cool um obviously we've already got the uh the nes one that came out a good couple of years ago now. This is going to be available from August 1st, so from Monday. Next week. Yeah. Next week, and it is going to be £209.99 pence or $239. Ooh. So, as always, Lego on the on the expensive side, but um does look really cool. It's a, a, essentially, you know, a one-to-one scale of the Atari 2600, which I really like. Um, and then also it comes with um, free cartridges of um, Asteroid, Centipede, and Adventure which also come with their little like cartridge, like holder, like bookshelf that you build as well, which I think is really, really cool. What do you guys think of this? Um, I think obviously it's a partnership with Atari. It mm. must be. Uh, to get yeah, it's, 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 in, it's in line with the 50th anniversary of Atari. 
yeah, and it and it shows yet again that Atari are doing more things and actually kind of getting to those retro gaming fans and mm. stuff and moving more away from these uh, virtual coins and hotels and all this kind of stuff. Yeah, well, well, funny enough, this website says this is the best thing Atari has, has actually done and Atari aren't even doing it. It's Lego. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I think price-wise, you could probably buy a 2600. Um, oh, easy. <laughs> oh yeah, price. easy. Yeah. yeah, 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 you could. You know, maybe people will do that. Maybe people, Lego enthusiasts, will see this set, you know, in the official trailer, um, they get a guy who's like, oh, I had an Atari when I was eight years old, 1980. And, you know, he's like, I'm 50 now. And this has just brought back so many memories. And it was so amazing to build it and stuff. But it also begs that question of off the back of that, how many people are actually going to go out there now and buy and try and find an Atari 2600, you know, and be like, oh, I want to play this again. And yeah. it's uh, begging, it's begging for periphractic gaming to um, kind of put a board in there and turn oh, it yeah. into a real, yeah. real device, <laughs> which he seems to do with a lot of like the Lego kind of stuff. Yeah, I've got to say, even though it's pricey, it does look very good. I mean, it's um, a replica of the original Woody, isn't it? Yeah. And like you said, to scale, you got the switches on top as well. You get the three cartridges to that actually fit in the front of it mm. in the cartridge slot. By the looks of it, you even got the controller that you make as well. Mm. Um, which you know, if you ca- if you kind of squint and don't look at the the joins, it does look like pretty much an, an original. Oh yeah, it, it, it looks like a one for one. But you know, I'm I'm gonna. I'm going to throw it out there. I think you're still building your Lego DeLorean for about 10 years ago, aren't you? Aren't you, Dan? So uh... Yeah, I'm waiting to go back in time and start it again. <laughs> um, the weird thing about it is as well, like you can kind of take the top off and there's a, a like a section which is a recreation of a house. Um, oh, yeah, what's or, that about? like an apartment and there's a little cat in there, like an old payphone on the I, I wall. Th- it's think like it's, a real mashup. It, it's stuff. meant to be like a bedroom. You know, yeah. like a typical yeah. typical Atari player, like in the seventies or eighties, like you know, there's a boom box on the back and there's some posters, which I think might be Atari, you know, meant to be like Atari games. Um, but like you say, it's, it's a bit random. There's a CRT and a cat and stuff, but it's cool. <laughs> you know, you take the top off and there's the bedroom in there. That bit to me just feels completely unnecessary. The fact that you know it is that's never going to be seen unless you open it up. Mm. And this set is already. 2,532 pieces. Oh, wow. It'll probably take me 50 years to build yeah, it. Yeah, keep the you that I do it. I guess that's like <laughs> but, uh, justification for the fun aspect of it, having the room in. And other, otherwise, it may seem like too adult nerdy. Um, like, you know, if, if you were going to get a kid this or something, you know. Yeah, yeah. I suppose parents might want to build it with the kids or something. Yeah, I, guess, I, but... I guess they had to have some sort of gimmick as well because the NES one, you had the CRT TV that came with it and, you know, you cranked it and it played Mario on the screen. Yeah, and you know you'd put the cartridge in the cartridge slot and stuff. So, uh, you know, and I guess they wanted to avoid just doing the same thing again and just having an Atari game on a CRT. Um, so maybe that's why they've done the several cartridges and the little bookshelf, and then obviously the, the bedroom on the inside is probably their kind of like answer to that. You know, having the gimmick in there. I guess the thing that always gets me about the um, twenty six hundred is those metal toggle switches that they have at the top, and they've done them really well. They look, mm, they look mm. really good. I hope they're functional, that like, you could actually knock it down a bit. They're probably not. <laughs> £209, though. Now, I've got to say, I haven't really bought any Lego since I was a kid. I mean, I used to buy you know small Lego sets and stuff. Lego just seems so expensive these days. I mean, has it always been pricey, or is yeah, that more of a always, recent thing? It's always been pricey. Um, sets were, yeah, massively pricey. Like, Le- Lego was always passed down from generations. So uh, yeah. I'm building an Amiga... Yeah laptop and i actually went back to my parents house found my old lego box which had like loads of 80s stuff in there and everything and then kind of filled it up but still i've spent quite a lot of money already just creating a white box out of lego so i should have used like um what the fake lego <laughs> you know? stickle bricks i think stickle bricks are a lego uh thing or maybe yeah, mega blocks mega blocks that's yeah. the one yeah that's it so I've got to say, it does look really cool. And I think, you know, for collectors who are like, you know, hardcore Atari fans, it's going to be something very cool to have in your little, uh, your gaming den, definitely. So that's going to be available from Monday. Um, and if you want to check that out, I'll put a link to their official website in our show notes at theretrohour.com. Now we have got um, some news about a game that actually goes for so much money on eBay now, because we've been looking at it. That's now getting a re-release on the PC, and it sounds like about time as well. And... An incredible project to preserve Super Nintendo manuals in just a minute. But before we get into that, I just want to pause quickly to just double check. If you listen to our show each week, 
you do read Retro Gamer magazine, right? Because you know, if you love what we talk about, Retro Gamer gives you more of that. And it comes out every month, a real celebration of all things retro gaming. And of course, that is brought to you with our sponsor, our amazing friends at Future Publishing. Now, Future Publishing do the best gaming magazines, not only focusing on classic gaming and retro gamer, but also you've got stuff like Play, Edge and PC Gamer magazine as well, celebrating the classics and the current generation of gaming too. And we've got an incredible offer where you could subscribe and save up to 95% and get three issues of your favourite future gaming magazine for just one pound. Now, get your phone ready. I'll tell you what you need to do to get this special offer just for listeners of the Retro Hour in just a minute. But we've actually got the magazines in front of us here. And uh, I mean, we'll start with Edge magazine, Ravi. That's something, again, I mean, we've done episodes about the history of Edge, a really credible British gaming magazine that's been going since the mid 90s and still going strong today. Yeah, it's um, it's it's not always retro edge. You know, they have retro sections in there, but it's more about the kind of future of interactive entertainment. And uh, Mm. they're looking at a plague tale, which uh, looks really awesome. Requiem. And uh, I I, I actually subscribe to edge, you know, I I find some interesting writing in there and uh, you know they've got like independent reviews a lot of first looks and uh, insider access on games as well and of course being a pc gaming aficionado you read pc gamer as well oh yeah and they're looking at company of heroes free and you know me and my strategy games i absolutely love company <laughs> of heroes really good game and really tough actually um you know you've really got to think about your units and stuff in there and also warhammer 40k dark tide as well And if you're a PlayStation fan, not only um, classic PlayStation, but also PS4, PS5, PSVR, Play Magazine's got you covered. Yeah, Play Magazine. They're having a bit of a retro theme this month, actually. They're going to be covering... They do a lot of retro. Yeah, a lot of retro stuff. But obviously, I think it's just, you know, it's that time of year and there's a lot of games coming out, which are, you know, kind of sequels and remakes. But they're going to be covering uh, the next instalment, the Final Final Fantasy VII remake, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, which I think is really exciting. And they're also going to be covering... Um, all the DLC that's just been announced for Resident Evil 8, which is going to be coming out in October, as well as a huge feature, exclusive access on Street Fighter 6, which looks really exciting. And of course, Retro Gamer Magazine at uh, this month, I love the cover. And um, the history of Wonder Boy, a special epic feature all about that incredible series. And uh, they also do the top 25 light gun games as well, which actually, funny oh, wow. enough, we were talking about light guns the other day, randomly. Um, if you're a fan of those classic light gun games... 25 of them featured in Retro Gamer this month. They also explore the early days of CD-ROM gaming and Donkey Kong Land, which seemed like the impossible port, didn't it? Donkey Kong Country on the Game Boy. So you can check that out and lots more and subscribe to your favourite future gaming magazine. Now, we've got this incredible offer for you right now. If you want to get three issues of your favourite future gaming mag for just one pound, open a new tab in your browser or your phone right now and head to magazinesdirect.com slash retro hour and save up to 95% on Retro Gamer, Edge, Play or PC Gamer on the website magazinesdirect.com slash retro hour and a big thank you to our friends at Future Publishing for their support of our show. Now, a couple more stories before we get into our special guest, Ed Rotberg. He's coming up in just a minute. Now, one thing I've got to say, not being a big owner of kind of original boxed consoles or just having kind of lost that over the years. I haven't got many manuals for my classic machines or the games. I think looking around, most of my games are kind of just loose carts or uh, just discs or maybe copies if we're talking about old Amiga games. But actually there is a really good fan project to preserve Super Nintendo manuals. Yeah, I think this is really cool. And, you know, kind of like in the the art of preservation, which is... A big thing that we're hot on, and you know, and something Ravi loves as well, you know, preserving this media, which you know could become lost, you know, over the next couple of years or decades. I really, really love this project. So, a streamer called Kerry Hayes, also known as Pebs on Twitch, essentially was going for a full Super Nintendo UK uh, library, and essentially, when they got around to 650 games in the library, they thought, you know what, like. I really should preserve this. So they started scanning in the manuals and it's not just like, you know, one page of it or the front of the book or anything. It's the whole manual and they're all like in really, really, you know, really good to mint condition because obviously it's, it's a collector, you know, 
while doing this project with the help of like, you know, forums and, you know, Reddit and stuff like that, because I'm part of a lot of these like, you know, collecting um, sites, even on Facebook and stuff and these groups, you know, for uh, I do it for like Sega Saturn and stuff, obviously mm. managed to compile the entire POW library, you know, of like good to mint condition manuals and, you know, spent the best part of the last year or so essentially uploading all these manuals onto this, uh, onto this database, which I think is really, really cool. You know, and as of July 2022, we've got the entire power library completely uploaded for people to check out. I just love the fact that this project probably started like, I'll just scan one. Yeah. I might as well do another one. Yeah. And, and then it's that realization of like, oh, wow, you know, I'm probably close to an entire set here. Maybe if I reach out to some people who have some super rare games or better condition, you know, manuals and stuff like that, we might be onto something here. You know, and like I say, in terms of preservation, I think this is really cool because of, you know, Nintendo aren't doing this, you know. Sega aren't doing it for the Mega Drive or anything mm. like that. One of my fears is obviously something I always joke about is Nintendo going to take this down? Surely not. Hopefully not. Well, you never you, know. Well, it's, never- it's, it's, it's on archive.org. Archive.org have a probably better reputation than most for having stuff up. They have That's had good. Nintendo stuff taken down, but um, out of all of the places, I think archive.org is probably the best to have it on. Yeah, that's good. You know, and Hayes has said they're not in it to make money. They're not going to charge people for this or anything like that. You know, you can just go look at it and stuff. There's been a few comments. Is somebody going to try and do the full Japanese library? Um, There was a lot more Japanese (laughs) Super Nintendo games than there was uh, PAL and US. But, you know, it's definitely a massive, massive start. And the quality of it, it's very readable. You know, it's, it's not blurry or anything like that. It looks like digital images, you know, like as in, the original kind of like drawings of them, they've been scanned in that well. The high quality scanner yeah. by the looks of yeah. it. It's weird as well because occasionally, I don't know about you guys, did you ever kind of read game manuals when you were a kid? Yeah. All the time. Yeah. All yeah. the time. I used to love like reading fighting games and reading the stats all about the fighters, which would sometimes have their birthdays and their heights in there and stuff like that. Or storylines. Um, storylines, you know. Story lines, yeah. You know s- yeah, definitely. It would add extra content and, and mm. kind of context to the game as well. I used to do it particularly with... Um, kind of cassette games on the Commodore. I'd always kind of look at the inlay and there'd always be like, you know, a couple of pages, you know, you'd fold it over and there'd be a story about, you know, some kind of breakout clone and there'd be some like massive backstory behind <laughs> it. And you're like, oh, okay, cool. Um, obviously some got an active imagination, but yeah, I think it, it is interesting to kind of look back on it. And not only that, but also I find myself over the years, you know, maybe playing a game and then finding a scan of a manual online because I couldn't do a certain thing in a game and, you know, maybe a control I'd seen someone do something on a YouTube video and didn't know how to do it. And then mm. finding a manual online as, ah, so you do that key, that button combination and that's how you do yeah, it. Yeah, maybe you would learn something after years of playing yeah. the game. You're like, oh, there's this function that I never actually bothered with. I, I really actually learned to get into manuals for that reason because I had so many games that I was struggling with and I'd just pick up and i think, I'll be fine on this. And then uh, once you've actually read the manual, it had a lot of information. And that was like, before you'd have like, you know, pop up tool tips or you'd have like guides within the game or even like, you know, tutorials or mission briefings at the beginning and stuff where you actually get to learn the functions because a lot of games started like holding your hand later on, didn't they? And they were like, oh, they all do that. Yeah, 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 we'll take you, take you through and, you know, you have to do this huge tutorial. I remember, um, Full Spectrum Warrior, letting Joe play that, and he was just doing the tutorial for about four to five <laughs> Yeah, it was like two hours to get <laughs> yeah, through yeah, it. Exactly. <laughs> Whereas back in the days, that would have just been a huge, thick manual that you'd have to sit and read through. I mean, manuals kind of vanished, didn't they, around just after the, the PlayStation 2 era, really, I suppose, and the original Xbox. I've got some you know, PS2 games with pretty thick manuals in there when you open the cases, and then obviously when PS3 came along with Blu-ray discs and those smaller cases... Maybe it was a fact that, you know, they couldn't fit them in or, like you said, just kind of bake them into yeah. the game. But it always felt like you're getting value for money when mm. you picked it up and had a really heavy manual in the I inside of the case. you do get there. some in those, like, limited edition versions of stuff now mm. and, like, you know, special prints. But also, it's, it's, really, um, it's really kind of reduced now. So a lot of the time I found you get really basic instructions about four translations into different um, languages, but also just kind of legal mumbo jumbo and stuff yeah. in there and there's not really the information or the the love and passion that was put into it so uh great to see these online 
Yeah, and hopefully that will uh, inspire lovers of other systems to do the same. You know, it'd be nice to see a full Mega Drive manual scan up there and, you know, other future systems as well. So um, definitely worth a look. That's on archive.org right now if you want to check out those Super Nintendo manuals collection. Now, we were talking about a PC game. You mentioned Limited Run there, actually. We were looking at um, copies of Blood. Now, today, randomly, you were in a, a retro gaming shop. And you saw a copy of Blood in there for um, about £100, and we thought, oh, that's a bit pricey. Then we looked on eBay. Yeah, um, Blood's, Blood's an interesting title. I, I looked at it uh, years ago because this was also built on Ken Silverman's build engine, which was a mm. kind of William Shatner's tech war was built on their Shadow Warrior, uh, Dune Nukem 3D, of course, being the uh, main game. And Blood was this kind of gothic, horror-themed steampunky kind of game it really actually reminded me of chaos engine mm. back in the days it had that kind of like vibe and uh it was it was just dark it felt like if you're into horror movies or, or vampires or something blood is the title for you but i'm surprised to see that it's so rare and i guess i guess that's maybe because they had a smaller amount of print or something like that i, I don't know why these games get rare but yeah Amazing to see that uh, it's commanding quite a price nowadays. Well, we're looking on eBay before, weren't we? And there was um, there's one on there, and it's got 27 watches. What was it going for? Fourteen hundred pounds. Yeah, it's currently I think on. They're selling now. for about three hundred at the moment and stuff. So, yeah, yeah, that was like a, a mint condition a one, wasn't probably. it? But still, yeah. but yeah, I, I don't like you say, Ravi. It's interesting that it's because um, it's got a big fan base, and you, like you say, it's in the heyday of like Doom clones, if you will, and you know that kind of two D to three D. Uh, engine and stuff like that and blood's one of those i'm not a pc gamer as you guys all know i'm the console guy and blood's one of those games i've always wanted to play um and you know this is really cool that it's getting the limited run collector's edition that's going to be coming out later this month uh coming out next month and i just wish they were bringing it to like playstation and xbox it is still exclusively to the pc which is quite interesting uh, because often when limited run do this they will put it out on the switch and the playstation as well i've Uh, just um realized why it was it was so rare because it was shareware, of course. Ah. So uh, you know the full retail version. A lot of people would have got the shareware version and maybe upgraded that, but there we go. Uh, not bought the uh, full retail CD-ROM big box one. Yeah, there we go. Oh, that's interesting. Um, but in terms of priciness and stuff like that, it's still you know kind of holding on to its price. So um, Limited Run are going to be doing the Blood, the Fresh Supply Collector's Edition, which is one hundred and fifty dollars. Which comes with obviously comes with the game um, and a big box version of the game, which is very cool. But it comes with all sorts, like an action figure of the main character and sticker sheet and prints and um, a, a liquid filled mouse pad, so a blood filled <laughs> mouse pad, which is really cool. Oh no, um, yeah, kind of gross, kind of gross, but really cool. <laughs> I can't actually find a listing for just the game itself though on the on their website. So hopefully they do just do the game as well and not just this hundred and fifty dollar version of it. This version uh, was Night Dive Studios. Yeah, uh, who created rec- it, but it was recently- actually c- commissioned by Atari as well. Oh wow! I was going to say um, Night so- Night Dive have recently done all like the Exhumed and uh, Power Slave like remakes and stuff or remasters, haven't they? So that's really cool. That they're yeah, it this. kind of passed on to Atari mm. uh, the Blood Blood brand and Blood Two as well did. And uh, yeah, this one's got like compatibility with modern operating systems like 4K. Uh, anti-aliasing, ambient occlusion, and all these kind of modern improvements. Yeah, and you can play online in co-op mode as well, you know, on modern servers too. Um, they've got local split screen in there. One thing I think is really cool is you can run your, roll your own soundtrack as well. Um, so, you know, kind of put your own files into the game. Look fully up and down with a new 3D view. So I guess in the build engine, you couldn't look up and down, could you? It was just left and right. Yeah, I think so. Um, I, th- I think it might have been faked up and down <laughs> you know yeah maybe I'm i know sure. what you mean yeah yeah so it looks like um if you're a fan of the game the price here 149 dollars. if you want a nice box copy of it like we said we're selling for a lot more on ebay now so it would be a good way to get a nice mint condition of it and for collectors i mean of these kind of cult games now just getting all the extras that they're offering as well i think is very very cool so that looks like it's available now um in pre-production actually in order right now on their website at limitedrungames.com Now, we're going to be joined by our special guest, Ed Rotberg. He's coming up on the show in just a minute. Now, before we do that, just another quick mention from one of our supporters, and that is our friends at BetterHelp. Now, obviously, the world has kind of been 
all over the place. I mean, so much has changed over the last couple of years. And not everyone's had an easy time of it over the last couple of years. It kind of varies. But I think there are definitely ways that we should be paying a bit more attention to our mind and a bit more self-preservation. I think that's one thing that definitely I think has come out of the last couple of years. Oh, a hundred percent. And you know, I'm, I've said it before on the podcast, I'll say it again. I'm a really, really, really big advocate of looking after yourself and especially looking after your mental health. And, you know, people get poorly, people get sick and we accept it. You know, when somebody gets the flu or somebody gets a cold or even hurts themselves, breaks a bone or something like that. But there always still seem to be this stigma and I, of, around mental health. And I'm a strong believer that you don't have to have any sort of like diagnosis into having mental health. Sometimes we can just feel under the weather in our brain, mm. in our mind, a cold for the brain. And sometimes that can get to us and it can spiral out of control and it can make us worse. So I really, really implore people to check out BetterHelp because if it helps so much just to talk to somebody, you know, whether that's over the phone or even just over a text box, just getting it off your chest, even if there isn't, you know, anything there, what you feel like is making that happen, it could just be you're feeling a little bit low and a little bit under the weather. Yeah, so this is our sponsor this week, BetterHelp Online Therapy. Now, they offer loads of different methods as well. You know, it can be video, it can be phone. Even if, you know, you're not comfortable doing that, it can be live chat-only therapy sessions that you do on your keyboard. You don't have to go on camera if you don't want to. A lot more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can be matched to a therapist in under 48 hours as well. Now, we think this is a really important service, and we're really pleased to be working with BetterHelp, and that we've got a great offer as well. So if you want to take advantage of this, our listeners get 10% off their first month by heading to our website, betterhelp.com slash retro. Use that custom link so they know that we sent you betterhelp.com slash retro, and I'll put that in our show notes. And a big thank you to our supporters at BetterHelp. Now, before we get into our chat with um, our special guest, Ed Rotberg, quick reminder that we do have a Patreon that we run for this show as well. If you want an easy way to support us and uh, get lots of bonuses, you get the After Hours podcast, where we're actually uh, just about to record one after this, where we're going to be talking about the best video game sequels of all time. And also, you get the normal show early most weeks, you get it ad-free, you get extra patrons only content, and... The big thing is, of course, you will get a mention in the most prestigious high score table in the world of retro gaming, and that is the Retro Hour Hall of Fame. Hall of Fame. And one new supporter to give a massive thank you to this week, a big thanks to Mikey McCorry, who backed us on Patreon. Really appreciate your support. And if you'd like to join him as well and the Retro Hour community, we'll see you on Discord and in our monthly patrons hangouts and give you a mention in next week's Hall of Fame. All the details to so join our patron are at theretrohour.com. Right then, time to get into this week's special guest, getting some memories from the early golden age of Atari with our guest, Ed Rotberg. He's next on the Retro Hour podcast. You're listening to the Retro Hour Podcast, and it is time for our favourite part of the show when we welcome on a veteran of the video games industry to share some stories with us. And today, it is a privilege to welcome on someone who was a core member of Atari's coin-op team back in the heyday and also uh, worked at companies like 3DO, Apple as well. Let's welcome on our special guest this week, Ed Rotberg. How are you doing, Ed? I'm doing well. I'm doing well, thank you. Really appreciate you coming on and uh, sharing some of your stories with us now. We're very excited to um, talk about those early days at Atari. Uh, but before we do, I mean, we always kind of like to get a bit of background on our guests. I mean, do you remember where your journey with computers and electronic games originally began then? Yeah, I do. Um, to be honest with you, uh, it, it started <laughs> very early on for me, uh, given when, you know, when early on was for me. Uh, I had my first uh, exposure to doing uh, video, or not video games, but games and computers before we, you know, had access to personal computers on large mainframes, um, starting with uh, my freshman year uh, in college. And then uh, that moved on, and uh, actually uh, my senior year for an independent subject project, I programmed a Lunar Lander game. So, but I had done a bunch of other games before that, um, or, you know, a few, I should say a few other games before that, everything from, you know, making a, a PDP-8 play music on a little radio and, uh, you know, just fun little toys and stuff like that. Well, when did you first become aware of 
arcade games? Well, that's uh, it, it was in the the late seventies. I was uh, I was wandering around down in Rush Street in Chicago. I'm a I'm a Midwest boy. Grew up in Chicago, and uh, wandered into a bar with some friends, and we saw Pong. So I would guess this was probably around seventy six or seventy seven. And uh, again, we played uh, for an extended period of time. The time gets confused when you're drinking beer, um, but. Uh, <laughs> I was totally taken with you know the 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 idea of playing a game on on a video screen. Meanwhile, I was working at that time uh, for a pharmaceuticals company here in the states. I was interfacing laboratory equipment to microcomputers, which had just then become available. I mean, they'd been around for a year or two, and so I was you know programming games like Mastermind and and things like that on 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 the mainframe, not even on the microcomputers. Um, and uh, a coworker of mine brought in an ad from InfoWeek, which was an industry rag back then, saying, uh, this, looks, this looks like it's for you. And uh, it was an ad by Atari looking for programmers. So I guess that's when I really started thinking about that as a potential career option. What was the um, interview like? Um, well, the interview was kind of in two parts. Um, First interview was over the phone with a gentleman named Steve Kelfie, who was the gentleman I went to work for when I did go to Atari. And he interviewed me for about a half hour on the phone. And then I guess he was doing a bunch of second interviews because he flew into O'Hare Airport and he had a hotel room at the airport. And I went, <laughs> I remember going to uh, the airport for the interview and here I am, you know, typical for interviews back then. You dress up in a suit and tie. And I knock on his hotel door, and uh, there he is in, you know, like a polo shirt and blue jeans. And the first thing I did was, and I think this is what got me the job, is I took one look at him. And I said, oh, thank God. I took off my tie and jacket, threw him on the <laughs> bed, and we talked. And that set the tone. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps. <laughs> well, when you got to Atari, I mean, the first game you're credited with is Atari Baseball in 1979. So was that the first project you were working on when you got to Atari? And what's kind of the, the story with that game? Yeah, it was the first game I, I worked on at Atari. Um, at the time I had come in, Atari football, which is American football, with the two big track balls and a stand-up tabletop, was doing really, really well. It was a hit game for Atari at the time. And they wanted to reuse the hardware and maybe come up with a ROM set that could uh, be exchanged in the field, running on the same hardware uh, with a with a, uh, a panel change and, and a ROM set. Um, and uh, they, you know, said, uh, do you like baseball? And turns out I'm, I'm actually kind of a baseball freak. So I said, yeah, I'd love to do a baseball game. And they said, great, you have three months. I programmed Atari Baseball in three months for them. Well, what kind of hardware was it running on? And um, how big was the team? Was it just you going for it? Or were there more people joining you? There was um, a, hard, a hardware engineer and, and a technician and me. Basically, it was a four-bit deep grayscale stamp-based hardware. It uh was not a, a bitmap. It was a basically stamp-based hardware with with a few motion objects. I can't remember exactly how many it had. Probably about three or four. I mean, not three or four. Probably about somewhere between four and eight. And um, it was a 6502 processor. And uh, the hardware changes were minimal, uh, primarily just to support the, um, the new uh, panel, which would have... Uh, slightly different set of buttons and things and lights than the uh, football game did. There was an interesting thing. There was a daughter board that was created by the engineer Dan Pliskin to, uh, to do um, actually voice. This, it would have been, had we released it with the game, it would have been the, the first uh, you know, game having voice output uh, you know, before Sinistar came out with it by a few years. Um, oh, wow. But it only it only spoke like four phrases: uh, ball, strike, safe, and you're out, and that was it. Uh, and we decided uh, that the the cost was not worth the uh, advantage we would get from it. So uh, back then, everything was about keeping your production costs as cheap as possible. Yeah, and memory wasn't cheap. Memory wasn't cheap. <laughs> Components weren't cheap. 
Um, and so it was all to drive down the cost as much as possible. That's why the idea to reuse the hardware that was out there. And, you know, if you're selling software um, with just a, a ROM and, and control panels, um, it's a lot cheaper. You yeah, can, that makes sense. Higher margin, much higher margin. Well, I always feel like, you know, when I hear these stories about Atari in the late 70s, early 80s, that must have been such an exciting place to work at the time. I mean, what was kind of the atmosphere like working there? And obviously you're working alongside people like Nolan and Ed Log. I mean, what was kind of the atmosphere like? Yeah, it was, uh, you know, I, I had worked in, you know, in the computer industry for a few years there. This was not my first job. A lot of Atari's people eventually came right out of, of college and stuff, but I was blown away. Um, first of all, it was an atmosphere that encouraged creativity from the minute you walked in the door. Second of all, the group of people that we worked with, um, the programmers, uh, the hardware engineers, uh, the technicians, later on the artists uh, were just, and this extends beyond through my whole career uh, in the video games industry, that group was the most talented and creative group of people I ever worked with. Um, it, it was it was just an, elate, an elation to be in the building with these people. So, yeah, uh, I can't say enough awesome things about it. Well, in 1980, you worked on a, one of the most innovative games, which was the classic Battlezone. Uh, where did the idea come from that? And uh, what was it like to develop? And what, what do you think about the legacy of the game nowadays? Because uh, lots of people still love that title. The game concept actually came out of uh, one of the company brainstorming sessions. There was a once a year, uh, the company would solicit from all the, or I should say the coin-op department. There was a consumer group, and they were very separate, uh, to be honest, even though engineering for both groups were in the same building. The, the coin-operated group solicited game concepts from everybody in the coin op division, whether they were in manufacturing, whether they were in documentation, management, uh, programming, it didn't matter. Anybody could submit an idea. Uh, you could uh, ask artists in the department to help you uh, flesh out some storyboards, write up a short, you know, a description of the idea. And uh, there would be this big book of ideas that would uh, go out. Uh, they would have an offsite brainstorming session. And so they'd go through all the submitted ideas and they'd pick out, you know, the top, I don't know, 20, 25 ideas and flesh them out a little bit further, make comments and put them in a big book of blessed ideas. And so um, when that book came back and I was ready for my next project, Morgan Hoff, who was a project leader in the department, a hardware engineer and project leader, um, decided he wanted to do a first person tank. You know, Atari had done some top-down tank games, combat, and they called Tank and Take 8. And uh, they thought this was a natural for doing a 3D first-person game since we had a vector generator and uh, some ideas about how we could do a, a math coprocessor uh, to go along with the 6502. So um, at that point, he asked me if I wanted to work on it, and uh, I was fortunate enough to have done some 3D programming as well as some vector graphics programming in college. So uh, I said, hey, sure. Uh, and uh, that's how the whole thing started. Obviously, those you know, 3D wireframe graphics, they were incredible for the time. Was it challenging to implement them? Um, well, uh, once again, I, I have to tip my hat to a couple of other people here. Uh, Mike Alba uh, and Jed Margolin worked together to create the, the 3D math box. And uh, Jed came up with uh, uh, the idea of, I don't know how much you know about 3D math and the history of it and everything like that, but it was primarily done with, uh, you know, three by three or four by four matrices back in the day. Um, mm -hmm. But Jed had the idea that if we were really playing this game on a 2D platform, you know, uh, basically tanks moving around on a flat ground, we really only needed to do a two by two matrix. Um, and then still you would have to do the uh, perspective divide at the end of the uh, pipeline. Um, but that became possible to do with the help of this 3D box, uh, 3D math box that was 
made up of a bunch of 2901 bit slice processors. Now I'm getting really techy here. Put together, you know, the, the code that would uh, format the uh, data in the proper format, uh, shuffle it off to the uh, processor to uh, transform a bunch of points, uh, then uh, once again reformat them off to uh, uh, the, the math box to do the perspective divide, which would have taken forever on the 6502. And that's how we got the, uh, went from 3D points in 3D environment to 2D points on the screen. Uh, there was a lot involved uh, in organizing the data to make all of this efficient. Yeah, that's how that all came about. How important were instructions and did players ever kind of struggle with arcades <laughs> and just the concept of actually using it? There wasn't a lot of struggle with Battle, battle Zone. I never really heard about any. And, you know, this was like still early on in the days of arcade games and video games to begin with. You always were striving for the simplest instructions. If, if, if you needed to put too many instructions down on the control panel, uh, your game was going to have a problem, to, you know, um, because back at this point, we still had very, you know, novice players there. They're, these were not seasoned, you know, gaming people. So you wanted to keep instructions and keep the concept as simple as possible so that there wasn't a steep learning curve. Well, even right, you know, talking about Battlezone, quite an interesting piece of trivia about that game is um, the U.S. Army commissioned Atari to create a special version of that game. I mean, what was kind of the, the story with that then? Because that was quite unusual. Yeah, um, not my favorite chapter in the history of Battlezone, but um, one of the guys I was working with, uh, well, who worked at the company, uh, was a manager there named Rick Moncrief. He had been contacted by, or at least Atari had been contacted by a group of uh, retired generals, and they ended up sh shoveling this off to Rick. And uh, they were interested in pursuing a training device using the Battle Zone hardware, something that would train uh, their soldiers to, uh, they could have a game where they could uh, get useful tactile feedback and and operational feedback uh, for one of the uh, fighting vehicles, uh, the Bradley fighting vehicle that uh, was being produced. And after Battlezone was finished, uh, Rick came to me and said, uh, you know, this was a few months after Battlezone had finished, and said, you know, uh, you know, we've promised these guys we're going to get something to get a demo together for them uh, for the next, uh, it's a thing called Tradoc, and that's uh, where, you know, it's, training for, you know, various military groups would get together and discuss different ways. And they wanted to propose training them with the game. And uh, they wanted a demo unit that would uh, demonstrate that soldiers could in improve their efficiency and competence uh, by playing uh, a game. And so I had uh, th this, the next TRADOC meeting was like three and a half months away. So I had like three months to develop this. It was not trivial. We had to develop an entire new controller. There were a lot of things involved. Uh, they basically wanted to train the gunner position, uh, but the vehicle had to move as well. So there were things with that. There were like four uh, different types of ordnance on these vehicles, uh, a machine gun, incendiary shells, armor piercing shells, and tow missiles. And so we had to uh, simulate all of those, uh, which in battle zone, it was... There was no gravity. Um, there was there was no trajectory to the shells. They just went in a straight line. Well, all of these weapons, with the exception of the tow missile, had to deal with gravity, um, and mm -hmm. there had to be ranging uh, information. And so it was a fairly hefty project to get done in three months. I basically lost that three months of my life. I would go into work in the morning. I'd work about 16, 18 hours. I'd come home, go to bed, get up, kiss my wife goodbye, and you know, rinse and repeat for three months straight, including weekends. So um, that was a big burnout for me. You know? It also sounds like, you know, because before that, you I mean, you're making games that are designed to be entertainment and fun. Now, all of a sudden you're doing like a, a simulator for soldiers. That's quite a change in, in ethos as well, isn't it, I suppose? Yeah, it is. And in, in fact, I, um, at the, the, the brainstorming session that came up during the time of, of this, uh, I did go off site for that. Uh, I had made it clear before, by before I started on this project, that I would only work on it if they assured me that I would not have to work on any follow-up military products ever for Atari, uh, because I wanted to do fun. Uh, I didn't want to train killing. I had a uh, you know philosophical problem with that as well. 
So um, they agreed to that. And uh, at, at the brainstorming session, I made a very impassioned plea that this was not a business that Atari should get into. Um, one of my prior jobs had, had been uh, with Texas Instrument, who was doing uh, projects for the government as well. And, you know, I was aware of how when you do government contracts, uh, the government gets to look into a lot of things in your company. Uh, and, uh, you know, they can make something maybe a bit stronger than request, shall we say, uh, in how you do business. So I just didn't want to get involved in all that. I, I expressed my opinion to the company about it. <laughs> well, uh, you also worked on a game called Fire Beast, and that one never ended up kind of making it to the market. Um, what happened there? Well, yeah, um, Fire Beast was one of the games, uh, game projects I started after Battlezone. And I was a project leader at this point. And um, I wanted to do a game based on Anne McCaffrey's Dragon Riders of Pern books. And um, so I got on this game with Pete Lipson, working on it with me. And um, I developed a cool little algorithm, uh, which eventually I used in a game for another company called Snake Pit, but that's another story. But that would make these little snakes move around and with some control over what direction they moved. but in, you know, uh, pseudo random squiggly patterns. So this was the idea for the thread falling down was with this algorithm. If you're familiar with the Dragon Riders of Pern series, uh, that's uh, uh, integral to the storyline. But I ended up leaving Atari before that project was finished. And I said to the company, uh, to the management, I said, please, you know, try to get a license for this, for this IP so that you can put out a game called Dragon Riders of Pern. Um, they ended up, uh, you know, I guess attempting to do that and couldn't come to agreeable terms. So they changed the direction. The game became known as Fire Beast. Pete Lipson finished it on his own. And uh, he has one at, you know, at his house. But that's the mm. only unit I know of that exists to this day. It did. It was not a commercial success. I mean, around that time, you know, if we're talking like, as we're getting to 1983, of course, we had the, the great video game crash in North America. Right. I mean, how did that change things? And what are your kind of memories of that era? Well, it, it crashed like shortly after I left and I had gone off to form another company with two other gentlemen from, from Atari and we were doing contracting. So we were not really directly imp impacted by the crash. It was something that we didn't necessarily see coming, but by the same token, Atari itself was growing incredibly fast in terms of how much campus space they they owned, how many people they employed. And anytime a company grows that fast, you know, um, you're going to set yourself up for failure if something that you're doing or something external to you uh, creates a hiccup in your product acceptance. And that's what happened. And once Atari started having to lay off a bunch of people, you guys know what happened. I mean, it was primarily driven by the consumer uh, games. The Atari uh, game system was a big success. And then when other companies, after Activision, learned how to create games for it, uh, the market became flooded with product and there were no controls on the product. And a very large percentage of the products that were being rushed out to market were junk. They weren't good. They weren't fun, but they were cheap. And that basically, you know, broke the back of the system. I think that probably taught the industry a valuable lesson as well. Yes, it did. You know, it took a while before the Nintendo home game system came out uh, with their controls on quality uh, at Nintendo. Um, and that, uh, that uh, I guess, uh, renewed consumer acceptance of uh, home video games at that point. Well, around this time, you left to form your own company, as you mentioned. Um, so what was the story there then, leaving Atari and um, running Vidya when you went there, when you set the company up? Yeah, um, well, the Activision group had left uh, the consumer side of Atari, um, and they were off there making a whole lot of money. Atari had a bonus plan for when we did some games. Uh, those of us on the teams uh, that of the games that did well uh, would get uh, remunerated uh, with a bonus. We were not really privy to how that was calculated. And um, then another group split off from the consumer group uh, to form a company called The Magic. And three of us decided, mm, 
maybe we should do the same thing on the on the arcade side of the business. And so we went off and we formed our own little company called Vidya. Um, we did some art. We did a, a couple of arcade games for Gottlieb, neither of which were a big success. We also did some engineering uh, that was more of a success, uh, not in the video game side of things, but uh, for a point of sale kiosk uh, using Laserdisc. So, you know, we were employing people. We, you know, we're making money. Um, we hadn't made ourselves uh, fabulously rich until, uh, <laughs> and we didn't make ourselves fabulously rich, but Nolan Bushnell, who had left Atari, he knew about us, knew what we were doing. And when his non-compete with Atari ran out, um, he had Pizza Time Theater at this point, which was a, a pizza restaurant where they had, you know, arcades inside and animatronics and things like that. And he decided to buy our group so that we could engineer games exclusively for Pizza Time Theater and distribute them from, from there. And so he bought us out and we became a division of Pizza Time Theater and he renamed uh, our group to Sente. The story behind that is Atari is the name of a move in the game of Go. Mm. Sort of like in, in a chess, it's like a check. When you put someone in a check in Go, uh, a loose equivalent is to put someone in Atari, uh, to claim Atari position on the board. Um, well, th the checkmate move of the counter to Atari is Sente. And so we thought it would be really cute to call call the company Sente. Like a yin and yang kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> but what memories have you got of that era? It was a move for me out of direct product development. Uh, I was implementing tools. I was directing a group of programmers. I was, you know, you know doing, you know, some co-programming. And it was less fun for me by a long shot. And I was less good at it. I'm not a great manager. I'll be the first one to admit it. And so I eventually parted ways with Sente and went back to work with Atari, which was now a very much different group. Atari uh, had the consumer side of the business had been bought out by uh, Jack Tramiel. That was no longer the coin-op group was separate. But, you know, I still had a bunch of friends over in the coin-op group and they welcomed me back to come back to work for them at that point. And so I did. That's awesome. Um, I was wondering, there was a standout game at the time, which was uh, Blasteroids, which was a kind of take on Asteroids and took it to the next level. What were the ideas behind that? And uh, why, why did you guys think that Asteroids needed like this boost? When I came back, you know, uh, first thing I got to do is figure out a game to create. And I had been doing some brainstorming on my own and I had come up with an idea and I wanted to, to include a sort of rock, paper, scissors element in the game that, you know, I was coming up with. And um, so I went to pitch this to the uh, department manager at, the, at that time. And um, he said, you know, Ed, what we really need is we need an update to Asteroids. We need, you know, you know a new generation of Asteroids game. And, and, and I said, well, maybe I can work this rock, paper, scissors thing into an Asteroids game. And that's how Blastroids came about. And I saw there was a funny Easter egg in the prototype version <laughs> of Blastroids as well. Uh, no, it's in, it's in the release version, to my knowledge. Right? Okay, that, your head. <laughs> uh, oh no, 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 no! That is that is in the in the in the unreleased version. There is also an Easter egg in the in the release version. Um, if you don't have any coins in the game, and I think if you hold down all the buttons on the right-hand player side and you spin the wheel on the left-hand player side or do it the other way and you're on the credit screen for the game, it changes from, you know, uh, like uh, ship's captain Ed Rapperg to ship's captain Gabe's dad. We we got all our kids' names in or our relatives' names in and, and things like that for all the, all the team members. So that's just a, kind of a cute one. I forgot about the Spinning Ed Rotberg heads. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I always love like hearing about those Easter eggs from back then. Because obviously, you know, before the internet, you only find out about them through word of mouth. I mean, right. you must have kind of got a kick when people found them. We were always trying to put little things in, and it's kind of hard to pick them out. We had one big thing in, in Stun Runner, but it was not really um, suitable for younger children. So that didn't make it into the final ROMs. Um, <laughs> 
it was something you had to get all the way uh, to the end of the game uh, and finish it, but not have a good enough score to get on a high score table. And then you had to do something with the buttons and you would get a slightly different ending. And that was for Stun Runner. What was the ending then? I'm, I'm, I'm very curious. <laughs> Uh, it, no, it's only in in uh, in a set of ROMs that uh, one person owns, to my knowledge. Was it a rude ending that I take it? Yeah, <laughs> it was. It was a bit rude. I hope that uh, makes it. Maybe the maybe one day. maybe rude isn't the correct word. <laughs> Salacious might be more correct. Well, Atari made a huge leap uh, into 3D with Hard Driving, which was an awesome title. Uh, that was the first 3D polygon racer. What are your kind of memories of developing that? Well, I'll be honest. I the only thing I did for hard driving was uh, the music routine, the the whole music subsystem. That was done. Uh, the hardware was done by Jed Margolin, who was, as I mentioned, the guy who did math for the three D math, math box for Battlezone, uh, and he worked with uh, Rick Moncrief's team, um, and that was Max Behensky and Stephanie Mott and Jed Margolin, and their uh, technician was Eric Durfee. And that was their baby. Hard driving was their baby. They they did come and ask me to write a music driver, a music system for them, and I did that. They're you know very good friends of mine, so that was a fun thing to do. And then you know we used that hardware to do stu- uh, Stun Runner. What was it like the first time you saw that uh, polygon technology? Like especially after um, you know the wireframes of Battlezone, it must have been uh, really impressive. It was impressive and exciting that we could do this now. Um, and that's why I was anxious to, to do a game with it. Um, and the, the game I did after that was a game I did with Ed Log, which was a wonderful experience, uh, which also used uh, that hardware uh, as a base, a base hardware, it's obviously modified. I always imagine, you know, looking back at that game, what a big challenge it must have been. You know, cause it, they went to quite a big effort to make it accurate, didn't they? And obviously oh, having yeah. all the physics as well in a racer. I mean, do, do you remember that, you know, from observing their work on it and obviously being part of the team? Was that a big challenge to implement that? Oh, yeah. I mean, it was it was um, racing physics, if you will, up to that point. It all been pretty much fake. You know, just make it something easy. The players can turn the wheels however they want to turn them. And you'll figure out the car will just stick to the road. Uh, hard driving was the first game to um, do – you know, really modeled physics, uh, modeling the uh, coefficients of drag for the car, the uh, uh, the friction from the tires, uh, uh, the uh, acceleration the torque curves for the engine, uh, the, the uh, gearbox, all that stuff. And and you know, there were a lot of problems with involved with that. Uh, for example, you would used to pretty much do all of your physics during the video blanking of the screen. Uh, <laughs> Uh, or if you did have really good hardware, you know, uh, during frame time, but you would only do it once a frame. Well, it turns out if you try to do that with real physics, the whole model becomes unstable very quickly. So mm. they went over to a four millisecond from a 16 millisecond update rate. In other words, they were calculating the entire physics for the model for the the cars four times as fast as was nominally done in any other game up to that point. So it was a real breakthrough. Yeah, obviously you were talking about Stun Runner before. I mean, um, obviously that technology you mentioned was kind of based on the hard driving technologies. What improvements did you make then and how did you take that forward? Well, Stun, Stun Runner was pretty much straight out of the hard driving hardware with very little modification. We did modify the sound. We did go with a different soundboard, but the main board was basically the same. Yeah, so uh, you know that you know obviously totally different controls. Um, the hand the hand controls were basically a uh, degenerate version of what we used uh, in both. Uh, well, in the uh, Bradley Trainer, the uh, the militarized version of Battlezone, and also what was used in uh, uh, the original Star Wars and a number of games after that. Around this time, I mean, you mentioned what a big change it was when you went back to Atari. Obviously, they kind of split into two different companies. Why did you decide to leave Atari in the early 90s? And did it really change beyond all recognition at that point? Uh, yeah, uh, there were some things involved without getting into details with internal politics in the company and some, um, shall I say, promises that were made to us that were not being really held to. Um, and I decided that 
yeah, it just, yeah, it, there were things going on that uh, did not sit well. And so, you know, without getting into specifics, and I, at that point, I can only talk bad about people, so I'd rather not. Um, mm. I left the company and I went to work for Apple. What was happening at Apple at the time then? And what, what did you work on there? Uh, I went into uh, a, a section of the operating system group, um, which really goes back to my roots. Uh, that's what I did. My first job out of college was uh, work on an operating system for a uh, supercomputer uh, at Texas Instruments. So, I, you know, I was working uh, there and I was very happy uh, doing stuff that I liked and including some side uh, not directly operating system jobs that were fun. Um, and then there was a huge reorganization at Apple. Apple is kind of known for this. A uh, big layoff of people. They were laying off people with, you know, like, you know, five, four or five month severance packages. And here I was hoping, lay me off. I'll take a four or five month severance package. <laughs> I can find another job. But they didn't. They, they um, reorged me into a group uh, working on modems. Well, right. I didn't know anything about modems. I didn't really care anything about modems. Um, and so that's when I started looking around. Yeah, it must have it been was. quite a change as well because they weren't um, massive on the gaming. Like Apple II, they were really into gaming, and then it, it kind of petered off a bit. You know? It was not a game-centric company. That said, there were, there were a few veterans that were working at Apple, so uh, that, was, that was kind of fun. Well, you also worked at uh, 3DO, so you definitely got around. <laughs> did yeah, you... that's, where I, that's where I went after I left Apple. Did you end up meeting Trip, and uh, how did you get involved oh, yeah, with I, 3DO? I, well, everybody who works at 3DO meets Trip. Um, he interviews everyone that gets hired or that an offer is going to be made for. But beyond that, um, I eventually, uh, shortly after I started there, uh, I was originally in a slightly different position but shortly after i got there they moved me into the studio um and i reported directly to trip at that point so yeah i know trip pretty well <laughs> well you know when you first joined 3do then i mean what kind of what was the atmosphere like there because I, I remember when you know i first read about 3do what a promising company oh yeah it seemed to be at first and obviously you had you know some huge industry names there as well and that that technology i mean even though it was very expensive it was streets ahead of anything else we had at the time i mean what, what kind of your memories of that um it was very cool um there were a lot of uh people from the in industry who uh i knew of but didn't know real well like uh rj michael and dave needle and uh and so um Dave Maynard and, uh, you know, uh, just a, a bunch of people that were uh, people that I respected uh, from the video games industry were at work at, at 3DO. So I thought it was like a great opportunity for me. And you mentioned people like, you know, RJ and Dave Needler. Obviously, they were the one of the main guys behind the Amiga and then the right. Atari Lynx as well. It always felt like they were, you know, developing these incredible products that just for some reason didn't succeed as well as they should have in the market. I, I still, to this day, don't understand. Well, I have my an idea of why, but the Amiga was probably just released too early. It was not a stable enough product mm. when it was released. And a lot of people washed their hands of it early, but I thought it was just an incredible box. As far as the Lynx, I still don't understand why that didn't take off. The 3DO yeah. was a, a, a real kind of different idea setting a standard and having multiple third party companies involved did you um end up talking to any of these companies and was there much uh, kind of like input from them um interesting that my original position there was uh, to liaise with companies who had signed on to do uh third party products um but i wasn't really in that position long enough um to get to know anybody uh from those groups at all because I wound up going to the studio um, and uh, and working there. Um, at, at the first, when I started in the studio, I was directing, I was uh, managing all the programmers and the, that was when it was very vertical, it was a vertically orient, uh, organized studio where all the artists reported to an art you know, manager, all you know, the programmers reported to a programming manager uh, like that. And then I don't know about maybe a year in seven, eight months in 
we switched around into where there were a group of teams and everybody reported to their team manager. And I, I became a, a director of one of the teams. So um, uh, that's how things evolved at 3DO. And when the hardware made it onto market then, I mean, did you, yeah. did, did you realize that it wasn't going to be the success that kind of the team hoped it would be pretty quickly then? And what, why do you think it didn't succeed? Well, it's always software. <laughs> For these things, it's always just software. I mean, the 3DO hardware-wise was limited. At, at the time it was coming out, um, the true 3D machines were were being developed. They were in developed yeah. by by Nintendo and Sony, and and you know we we heard reports of them. Um, so the only way the 3DO could have made it into that business was with really really strong third party and studio product coming out quickly and that just didn't happen for any number of reasons uh you know part of it was we were based uh, strictly on um cd uh for mm. cd rom for you know uh and that was slower and part of it was a lot of the established groups were still working for you know sony and uh, nintendo and sega and it was hard to pry uh, talent away uh, to work on the 3DO. So um, once again, I, I I believe it was due to the software. Yeah, because I mean, it was a strange time, wasn't it? We kind of went from, it was that middle ground between the Genesis and the Super Nintendo and the PlayStation. I mean, really, I guess the 3DO's main competitor, right. you know, in terms of new consoles, would have been the, the Atari Jaguar, which um, suffered many of the same problems, didn't exactly. it? Even though it wasn't exactly. in the Exactly, they couldn't get yeah. enough software for it. But it was kind of in the same in the same boat as 3DO in terms of capabilities as well. Well, interestingly, I mean, you know, the modern day incarnation of Atari, <laughs> it's been through many different hands. I don't know if you keep an eye on what they're doing today. I mean, they've got a new console out and, you know, they're, yeah. they're bringing out some classic 2600 games on cartridge. I mean, have you kept an eye on them? And what, what do you think of what they're doing with the brand today? Uh, I've kept a kind of peripheral eye on it. Um, it it's not really, you know, anything that, that captures my imagination, you know, uh, as you, as you point out, they're re-releasing a lot of old titles. There's a large interest in retro gaming, and um, and that you know uh, that's what's going on. It's just not something that grabs me anymore. So, have you completely left the industry these days? Then? Yeah, what, what I'm retired. Oh, no, nice. I play games. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> are you still an avid gamer then? Avid. Um, I'm. A, you know, I still enjoy games. Um, I do a lot of board gaming as well. And things like that. My my son is a big time gamer, and uh, you know, uh, every year, like we we meet up at this one gaming convention in Madison, Wisconsin, in October. That's something we share. He lives across the country from me, so I don't get to see him often enough. I was, I was wondering, have you got any of that uh, original Atari hardware, and do, do you play on it, the original machines, or are you kind of emulating it? Um, I have one box left. I had a number of different you know, arcade machines for a while, but wound up not having the room for them. And so I have one that's sitting in storage, a battle zone. And that's, that's it. That's all I have from those days. Yeah. You've, you've got to keep that one though. Yeah. yeah I do. <laughs> oh, well, Ed, it's been absolutely incredible hearing some of your stories and your memories. So uh, thank you so much for coming on and uh, being our guest and chatting to us this week. It's been wonderful talking to you. Thank you guys. It's been a pleasure.